Well, my wife, Lorene, and I celebrated our 33rd wedding anniversary last weekend. And we celebrated by driving to Columbus, Ohio to watch one of our sons play college baseball. Romantic, huh? <laughs> Although we made it a little more romantic by staying a couple of nights in some really nice bed and breakfast places. Now, my parents, who are in this photo on either side of the ball player, uh, have been married for 62 years. And by the way, a little commercial here, my wife and I are, are leading a series of sort of seasonal specific marriage events this year. Uh, we have one coming up in a couple of weeks, May 19th and 20th, designed especially for couples who are in what we call the hectic season of family life. Those married between six and 19 years, the busiest time of life. And we're gonna get away for, for one day, one night, up in Lake Geneva at a resort there. We have two rooms left, so if you're looking for a chance to get away and be encouraged in your marriage, Look at your uh, church, your ch uh, Chapel Street app or check out the website or just talk to me after the service. We have two rooms left. We'd love to have you join us. That's in two weeks, May 19th and 20th. But one of the things I've noticed in watching marriages, both my own marriage and other marriages throughout my life as pastor, is that um, in some marriages, in troubled marriages, uh, people tend to pick up each other's worst characteristics, like selfishness or sarcasm, and the marriage sort of spirals downward. But in long-term healthy marriages, what I've noticed is couples tend to pick up each, each other's best qualities. For example, uh, my wife is organized and neat. Uh, she's a good administrator. She loves to keep our house clean and in order. But when we got married, I w w was pretty much a slob. I was single till I was 28, and I was the guy who saw no reason at all to wash any dishes until all the dishes had been used. Right? Am I right, guys? I mean, it makes no sense. So I'd end up eating the cereal out of pots and stuff because that's what was left. And when we got married, that, that, that didn't go so well. So uh, now after 33 years of marriage, I'm still not to her level, but I think even she would tell you I pay more attention now to stuff like dishes and laundry than I did before. So I'm picking up slowly her best qualities. But even beyond that, there are some researchers who believe that there's evidence that long-term married couples actually begin to look like each other. I saw an article in the New York Times recently that says, according to some recent research, couples who originally bore no particular resemblance to each other when first married had, after 25 years or so, come to resemble each other. The research also suggested that the more marital happiness a couple reported, the greater their increase in facial resemblance. For some of us, that's really good news. <laughs> the theory is that in long-term married couples, people will unconsciously begin to mimic the facial expressions of their spouses until they actually begin to shape their faces like each other. I have a few examples I found. How about this one? Aw, you can say it. Aw, isn't that sweet? How about this one? Next one. They even dress alike. <laughs> one more. They look so happy. And my personal favorite... So here's the point as we begin today. None of them go to this church, by the way. <laughs> the more time you spend around and with one who loves you, the more like them you can become. We're in the fifth week of our series called The Holy Spirit. And if you've missed a week, by the way, you can use your Chapel Street app or go to the website and pick up sermons. Just catch yourself up. It's been a, a, a good series that's driven us deeper into this doctrine and reality of the Holy Spirit. But I'm going to give you a little review. Okay, the Holy Spirit uh, is God. Oh, by the way, if you were here last week, you saw Pastor Jeff use the, the whiteboard the entire sermon. Just amazing, the artwork. And I got kind of inspired. <laughs> what? <laughs> so the Holy Spirit is God and is part of what the Christian theology calls the Trinity and has been present throughout the entire... <laughs> story of the Bible. Okay. My first picture is a picture of Jeff drawing. <laughs> That's obviously Jeff. I guess I could have made him bigger, but... <laughs> And so Jeff took us on this tour of all of Scripture, 
how the Holy Spirit, the Ruach of God, the wind, the breath of God, was present at the very beginning of Genesis, the creation of all things, as the, as the Spirit hovered over the waters, breathed life into human beings. And now God, through the prophets, then promised he would send his Spirit to bring newness of life. And now Jesus met with his disciples right before leaving them on the night of the Last Supper and promised that the Father would send another helper to be with them forever. And that the Holy Spirit would teach, would guide, would convict, and would glorify, would give us the power to become his witnesses in the world, and would bring new life. And Jeff used the symbol of the wind, which is the classic symbol of the Holy Spirit, and red is the color of the Holy Spirit throughout history, to demonstrate that. The question is, how do we get the Holy Spirit? As we begin, how do we get the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit, the Bible is very clear, is a gift to every believer. In Ephesians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul writes, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed. You see that? When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. So the Bible is quite clear. The Holy Spirit is a gift received by faith when we put our faith in Christ. It's a promise and it's a gift. Now today we're going to see how the Holy Spirit works to shape our lives so that we look more and more like Jesus. We're going to begin in 1 Corinthians where Paul is actually writing a letter to some brand new followers of Christ who've come out of a pagan world and he's trying to help them see how the Holy Spirit shapes their lives. He writes, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Now, most of us have heard this phrase before, body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, but we can kind of miss how extraordinary, how mind-blowing this teaching would have been to someone reading it in the ancient world for the first time. For example, for the Jewish people, the temple, when they heard the word temple, they thought of the great temple in Jerusalem. and the presence of Yahweh, Jehovah dwelled in the most holy place. This is a rendering of what the temple might have looked like in the first century. And so to worship God, you went to where he dwelled and you offered sacrifices. The only part of that uh, building that's left, the, the external retaining wall, the western wall, which is called the, retaining, uh, the wailing wall, and people still go there to pray because they believe the presence of God dwells in that wall. Now, for the pagan Romans or Greeks, a temple, and there were many of them, uh, was a building dedicated to one of the gods, small g, or goddesses, Artemis, or Aphrodite, or Zeus, or any number of pagan deities. Uh, this is a photo of the ruins of the temple in, of Zeus in Athens. You could go visit there if you want. Look at the size of that thing. See the people down below? So, to a person living in the ancient world, the temple was where the deities dwelled. He made this look a lot easier than it actually is. And you had to go to the temple to offer your sacrifices to try to please the gods. That's my crude temple. And this is my ancient person. You're laughing. So this person in the ancient world believed that he had to go to here where the presence of God dwelled. You had to go there to please God. You had to go there to, to offer your sacrifices to the gods. And Paul says no. He says no. What the Christian God has done, he doesn't know, no longer lives in temples built by stone and made out of marble. He, by his spirit, has come to dwell in you. And this is the radical difference of the Christian faith, the Christian God. No longer do you have to go to where the gods live. The, that God has come through his spirit to dwell in you. And now in Romans chapter 8, uh, we're going to camp here for the morning. We're going to see how Paul teaches then once the Holy Spirit indwells, what the Holy Spirit does. So Romans chapter 8, uh, beginning in verse 1. You can follow along on the screens or look on your, your app or your personal Bible. Paul writes, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life 
has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So we're going to break this down a bit. The first thing we see is that the Spirit sets free. The Holy Spirit sets us free. A couple of months ago, I saw a story in the news about a man named Nevest Coleman. Maybe you saw it. Nevest Coleman uh, lived in Chicago his whole life and worked as actually as a groundskeeper for the Chicago's White Sox. Uh, And he had never gotten in trouble, never been arrested. But in 1994, he was arrested and charged with an absolutely heinous crime, an awful thing, and sentenced to life without parole, even though there was no physical evidence connecting him to the crime. Later it was found out that the officers who were doing the arresting were corrupt and all that and forced confessions and that sort of thing. 23 years later, after 23 years in maximum security prison, uh, new DNA evidence was revealed to show he was not involved whatsoever. So the conviction was overturned and led to his freedom. He was released from prison a little earlier this year. This is a picture of him hugging his son for the first time in 23 years. I read that story and I thought, could I even imagine what it would be like to be set free? Paul says we can imagine. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Paul says, in Christ we are set free from something, what he calls the law of sin and death. Now, what's that? If we go back a couple of chapters in Romans, we find a clear explanation. Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So here's the law of sin and death in a nutshell. Sin is the refusal to trust the love of God. A refusal to believe in the truth of God's salvation. That's the origin of all sin. Sin is always insisting that we can be our own God, and sin is always destructive. Sin brings death, relational death, physical death, and spiritual death. We see it in Genesis, in the story of Adam and Eve, in the garden, when they resist God's limit and resist God's uh, authority in their lives. We see it in the world today. If we pay any attention at all, look at the world. We see this acted out all around us. Sin brings death, and we see it in our own lives as well. But, Paul says, the gift of God is that through the cross of Christ, the power of sin and death has been utterly defeated and destroyed. By faith, then, we are declared righteous. Remember, one of the roles of the Holy Spirit, we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, in our lives is to convict us, to convince us of righteousness, Jesus said. That is to convince us of our right standing before God because of what Christ has done. So we are all, in a sense, like Nevest Coleman, set free from condemnation, free from the law of sin and death. That's good news. That's the gospel. But we are not only set free from something, the Bible teaches we are set free for something. Continue in Romans chapter 8 with me. For God has done what the law, now here by the law, Paul's referring back to the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, and all that's required for God's holiness. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. See, the law shows what righteousness looks like, but it cannot make us righteous. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So we've been set free from the law of sin and death so that we will walk according to the Spirit. Now, what does that mean? That's what Jeff was talking about last week if you were here. It's what Jesus was explaining to Nicodemus 
In John chapter 3, in a late night conversation, he was saying, Nicodemus, you don't need a little more religion in your life. You don't need more laws and more rules. What you need is death and resurrection. You need to be born again, born anew, born from above. So it's the Holy Spirit of God, the Ruah of God, that blows into our lives through faith and recreates out of chaos and darkness a new life and new light. We are born again. And that's what enables us to walk according to the Spirit. And that leads us to the second point today, is that the Spirit transforms. The Spirit sets free, and the Spirit transforms. Earlier this week, I think it was on Monday, um, I had to take my wife to the airport for a trip she had to make. And uh, we were on the way to Midway, and we've driven there many times, know the way. We're always concerned in the morning that we're going to get into a delay that causes us to to miss a flight or something. So we're driving on the way, and we started to see, about halfway there, started to see the cars kind of backing up. So she she turned on the app on her phone, which is called Waze, W-A-Y-Z, which is a GPS directional app, and almost immediately began saying, turn off, turn off, get off at this exit. Now, we couldn't see what was causing the backup. We didn't know how large it was, long it was. We could see it starting. We didn't know what it was about. And to get off there was, was counterintuitive because it was not where we usually get off. It was like halfway there. How are we going to get there? If we turn off here, we could get utterly lost. So we had a decision to make. Do we listen to the little voice in the phone telling us where to get off? Do we trust it to be correct, to know the way, to be true? And do we follow? We ended up deciding, okay, let's do it. Let's follow so we got off, and sure enough, it took us, got, we, we, there was like a 10-mile backup. We got around it, got to the airport just on time. That's what Paul's writing here in Romans chapter 8. He says, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. So the Holy Spirit transforms our minds, gives us a new way to think by guiding us into truth. But he says, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Now, what does he mean by the flesh? You need to know that when Paul uses this term in the New Testament, he's not talking about our bodies, flesh like in our physical bodies. He's referring to that part of us, deep within us, that is alienated from God. The part of us that doesn't want to listen to instruction. The part of us that wants to be our own God, that wants to decide for ourselves what is right. The flesh is that in us which is opposed to the rule of God. And the flesh is sometimes what Paul calls the sinful nature. Now, for us today, I think it's helpful to think of this as an operating system of sorts. Most of us have a computer at home, PC, laptop, maybe even a smartphone. And what we see is the screen, the outward-facing screen of our computer. But we know that's not really the computer. The real part of the computer is the part we don't see. That's the inner workings, this mysterious thing called an operating system. Some of you know how they're built and maybe even build them. An operating system. And our lives are like that. Our behavior, our relationships, our choices are like the outward-facing screen of our lives. But all of that is driven by an inner spiritual operating system. To live according to the flesh, in Paul's mind, means to live according to an old operating system. The system that's driven by selfishness and self. It's a system that looks a lot like us. We want to be God. We want to rule. That's what it means to live according to the flesh. Now, how does the flesh manifest itself in our lives? Well, Paul takes a lot of time to talk about this later in the book of Galatians. He writes in Galatians chapter 5, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. So that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft. Right about here we're going, yep, bad, 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 bad. (coughs) Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Amazing, all those things jumbled up together. From stuff that we would go, oh yeah, I've never, never participated in that, to that, ooh, envy, 
I warn you and did as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the new operating system is love, joy, peace, patience, or forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. In a couple of weeks, we're going to spend a whole sermon just on the fruit of the Spirit. But what he's saying is, when we become followers of Christ, when you put your faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell you, give you a new way to think, and installs a brand new operating system. The wind, the spirit of God himself dwells within us. That's what Jesus meant when he said you must be born again. That's what Paul means when he says to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. He's saying that when we come to faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit installs a new operating system that transforms how we think, what we believe, and how we live. This becomes part three, and it happens because the Holy Spirit gives us new identity. The Spirit gives new identity. About uh, two months ago, I got a very disturbing flyer in the mail. It was announcing my 40th reunion for my college class. Have you ever gotten one of those? 40 is a big round number. Yikes. And uh, along with that, uh, they said there was a Facebook page established for the class of 1978 for my college. And when I went to that Facebook page, somebody had posted this picture. I didn't post it. This is, this is a picture of my freshman hall, 27 guys in my freshman hall. Uh, and I know right now you're trying to find me in the picture, so I'm going to tell you where I am in the picture. Try to disregard that giant bottle in the middle. I have no idea what that's about. But <laughs> I am all the way to the right, standing in the long coat, wearing the basketball shoes, and in my right hand, you see there, I have a basketball. And I saw it, looked at this picture, and I had not seen it in years and years and years, and it reminded me of something. I'm 18 years old in that picture, and at that point in my life, basketball had become a significant part of my identity. I'd invested a lot of time and a lot of effort, hours and hours and hours, trying to earn a college scholarship to play basketball, which I eventually did as a walk-on, and I was on the team. Um, Fast forward to my senior year. I made the team and all that. And so fast forward four, uh, three years ahead, my senior year. Uh, I was still on the team, been on the team three years. I'm a senior. And word had begun to spread around among the team that summer that we were going to get new practice gear that, that fall. And we were all excited about it because every year we get new practice gear. But this year we were going to get uh, practice gear that had special personalized monogrammed practice shorts. That doesn't sound like a big deal to you, but we had seen other guys from other colleges and universities in the summertime at camps and so forth, and they had like their names on their practice shorts, and it was so cool. So we were thinking, if we get, just get those, it'll show we're big time. We're, we're going to make, we're going to be big time players, right? So we're all excited to get back on campus, and sure enough, we got there, we got our practice gear, and everybody had their names embroidered right on their practice shorts, you know, I was so excited. I opened mine up, and because it, it was, it was going to mean all those years of sweat, toil, and hours shooting baskets were, were going were gonna to make me, I was going to arrive and be somebody. My name right in my shorts. And so I opened up my little bag, and this is what I saw. I thought, really? I have to tell you, it was devastating. I've been here four years. You don't know how to spell my name? My whole life it was spelled like that. It's not that, it's a Y at the end. So in case you write me a note, it's a Y. Sounds like what you drink, but it's a Y. See, I didn't realize it then. But what I see now is I, I had invested a good bit of my identity in something that didn't even know my name. You see, that's possible. Back to Romans chapter 8. Stick with me as we go through this. Beginning in verse 9. Paul writes, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. You have a new operating system. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, and that happens at the moment of salvation, it's a promise. The Spirit comes to dwell in your life by faith. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, that's the law of sin and death, we have been set free, or the Spirit of life, uh, Spirit is life because of righteousness. We have been set free from the law of sin and death. 
Verse 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who indwells you. That's the promise of eternal life. Verse 14, for those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. We have new identity. We are children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. By the way, the language there is so intimate. It's a father to a child, and that father never forgets your name. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Paul here is connecting faith to life, connecting what we believe to how we live, establishing the link between salvation, being forgiven of our sins, and living out our new identity in Christ. And the key is the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So if you're a believer today, if you've trusted Christ to forgive your sins. The Bible says the Holy Spirit dwells in you and has set you free from the law of sin and death. But Jesus did not go to the cross just to forgive your sin. That sounds a little funny to say. He did not go to the cross only to forgive your sin. He died and rose again to give you new life. That's what he was saying to Nicodemus. You must be born again. The Holy Spirit dwells in you, gives you a new mind, and a new operating system. Years ago, I had a conversation with a young man. He was in his early 20s. It was about something else, but in the course of the conversation, he said, you know, Pastor Brian, by the time I was about 18, I figured out this whole religion thing. I said, really? Uh, what'd you figure out? Well, he said that he and his buddies, when they were seniors in high school, maybe the year after high school, he said they, would, they got together and they would go to the earliest possible, he called it a mass, we would, might call it a service, on a Saturday morning, the earliest possible mass uh, in in a city, in their city, on Saturday morning. And he said they would pre-confess all their sins for the weekend. I said, oh, you mean like a sin credit card? He goes, yeah, exactly. I said, well, you know, it doesn't really work that way. He said, I know that now. But you see, that's not the gospel. That's not why Jesus went to the cross to give us a sin credit card. That's not what the Holy Spirit does. That's not a new operating system at all. That's pretending to be religious. That's pretending to have a relationship with God, but still walking according to an old operating system, the one called the flesh. See, it's possible here today that some of you have not yet taken the first step of faith. That you're like Nicodemus. You see religion, but you don't have a personal relationship with Christ. And Jesus says to you what he says to Nicodemus, you don't need a little religion in your life. You don't need a little God in your life. You need to be born again, death and resurrection. Or it's possible that some of you are still living as though God lives in buildings. He lives in buildings made of brick or stone. And so you you go Monday through Friday without him or awareness of him, and then you come here every weekend to get a little God in your life. No, Paul says. No, he came to dwell in you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He lives in you. And it's also possible some of you have put your faith in Christ for forgiveness of sins and salvation, but you're pretty much living day to day with an old operating system. So Paul would say, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. So glorify God in your body, in your life. We're going to close our service today with communion here at the table. Now the table with its bread and cup reminds us of what we're talking about, reminds us of the price that was paid for our salvation, reminds us that we have the Holy Spirit in our lives because of what Christ did for us. This table does not belong to our church. It belongs to the Lord. So if you put your faith in Christ, even if this is your first Sunday here, you're welcome to share with us. In a moment, I'll pray. The ushers will pass out the trays. There are two cups stacked together in each spot. Take both cups, hold them until everybody's received it. Then I will lead us through the taking of bread and cups. So let's bow in prayer. Lord, we thank you today for your word and the great promise and gift of the Holy Spirit. 
who dwells within us by faith. Thank you for setting us free from the law of sin and death, that we have no more fear. Help us to remember the new life you give through this bread and this cup today. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. The New Testament tells us that on the same night he was betrayed, which was also the same night that he promised to send the Holy Spirit, the Helper, Jesus took bread, blessed it and broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this remembrance of him. After the bread, he also poured a cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sin. The Apostle Paul reminds us that as followers of Jesus, each time we drink this cup, we proclaim his death until he comes again. Do this in remembrance of him. Just before the benediction, remind you that this is the first weekend of the month when we collect our benevolent offering. So if you're able and willing, as you leave today, the ushers will collect uh, whatever you have to give uh, because we use this to help people in our congregation as well as in our local area. So thank you in advance for your generosity. Receive now the benediction. May we go now in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and may the Holy Spirit fill you with his power and his assurance that you are children of God. Amen. Have a great day. <laughs>